Welcome back, everyone. Um, we are now moving on to our third presentation of, of the morning, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Krista Schulte and Colin Moore from the University of Michigan. Um, so at the beginning of, of this morning, we had Stephanie from Melbourne, and it was eight, nine o'clock in the evening for, for Stephanie. Um, for Krista and Colin, a, a different kind of um, perspective for them. It's um, I think seven minutes past six in the morning, I think, um, at the moment for um, Krista and Colin. So lots of coffee um, to keep them keep them going. Um, and it's an absolute um, thrill to have you here. And thank you so much for, for making the time so early in the morning to, to present to us. Um, so Krista leads um, Organisational Excellence, a programme at the University of Michigan. Um, offering consulting, coaching, training, and a community of practice to help um, staff, students address issues and uncover new possibilities. Krista joined the university in 2015 from Vistian Corporation, where she served as a lean advisor to global product development teams for over 10 years. And prior to that, she applied lean at Vistion and Ford in different engineering process leadership and operations roles. And Krista is also currently the chair of Lean HE Americas. Um, I've, I've known Krista since I think 2015. Um, again, one of the, the great things about this network is you can make um, lasting connections from across the world um, and, and learn from each other, share with each other um, what you do and how you do it. So I would absolutely encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, and then chatting to Krista, I think about a year or so ago, we were talking about what could we do in between international conferences to help build and maintain momentum. And um, I, I explained to Krista the concept of Lean HE Encore. And it's Krista, I have to give the, the credit of coming up with the name because she said, that's it's an encore of the presentation. So let's call it Lean HE Encore. So that's why we're we're here today, a combination of having those conversations. Um, so that that's that's Krista. Colin is a, a senior operational improvement consultant at, at Michigan, and Colin has a proven track record of creating efficient processes and strategies that drive operational transformation and success. He has successfully overseen the university's shared services center lean program and led valuable consulting engagements, earning the respect of his colleagues and clients. Colin's experience in coaching is highly regarded and he has guided numerous individuals through problem solving labs, empowering them to advance their ideas through to implementation. Colin's commitment to knowledge sharing is ever evident in his leadership of the League of Lean Leaders and his efforts to foster the adoption of lean practices across the Shared Services Centre. So as I said, I'm very grateful to, to Kristen and Colin for joining us today. And um, there'll be an opportunity, um, similar to the previous sessions, to ask Krista and Colin um, questions. They're going to speak to us today about leadership matters, which, which leader matters the most in delivering lean results. And I will end by saying, and this will mean something to Colin and Krista, go blue. <laughs> Thanks, John. Good morning, everybody. Um, really excited to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, so we feel very honored to be here. Um, uh, we will be drinking coffee along the way to um, help help us wake up a little bit. So, um, so let's jump into this presentation. Um, thanks, Colin. Um, Colin and I, are, I'll just warn you, Paul and I are going to be um, trading back and forth at some point with our screen sharing, um, helping each other out and um, fingers crossed for a smooth transition there. So our presentation is called Leadership Matters. Um, we have talked a lot about leaders in this lean community and their impact, um, but we're, we want to bring a new angle. We want to talk about which leader we think matters the most in delivering lean results. Um, Colin and I did an analysis a few years ago that we're really hoping will add another dimension to this conversation. Um, so um, 
Um, if you could go ahead and advance the slide one for me. Thank you. So the three things we're going to touch on is first, we're going to talk about the problem. Um, what were we facing? What, what led to this whole conversation that we're going to be talking about today? We're going to share with you um, the investigation we did. I mean, it was, it was a mystery. We really had no idea what was happening. So we did an investigation. We're going to walk through our analysis with you. And finally, we're going to share our discoveries. Um, I think these were very surprising to us and hope that they're surprising and interesting to you. So with that, um, I'm gonna pass it back to Colin. All right, thanks, Kristen. Um, so as we begin our presentation this morning, um, we'd like to understand the views of you, the audience that we're speaking to on two specific questions uh, related to leadership. So I'll invite you to share some of your answers with Menti in a minute, but I first wanna set the stage for the questions that we have for you. Um, so the first question that we're interested in understanding is what you think the most important behavior for effective leadership is in an organization. And this is open-ended. Uh, the second question that we're curious about uh, are your views on what you believe is the most impactful level of leadership within an organization based on three different levels. So do you think the most impactful level of leadership is a frontline supervisor? So someone who is responsible for overseeing individuals directly involved with the, the basic level of operations. So this person would supervise individuals closest to the work being done. Or do you believe that the most impactful leader is a mid-level manager? Uh, the supervisor's immediate superior, often could be a, a manager or director. And finally, uh, do you believe that uh, the executive representing the highest level of leadership within an organization holds the most impact? So for example, it could be a dean, vice president, or a chancellor. So with that, please take a moment, um, grab your mobile device, scan the QR code, or if you're on your laptop or computer, um, you can type in the code at the bottom there, 4421-1431, um, and visit menti.com to provide your answers. Uh, and I'll wait a few moments before we dive into um, what you shared. Okay, let's see. Questions here, waiting for responses to come through. All right, so we can start with the second question. So what is the most impactful level of leadership? Uh, so right now, it looks like uh, the mid-level manager um, is taking the lead here. Um, the first time we've seen that uh, come up as like the most impactful level of leadership. So that's very interesting. Um, let's see here if we have a word cloud that's working for us this morning. Oh, there it goes. And now it's generating. All right. So as far as the behaviors that you think are most uh, important or um, for good leadership, so transparency, uh, definitely in the center there, support, integrity, honesty, humility, empathy, great great attributes. Um, so some of these, I think we'll, we will be sharing uh, a little bit more on as we go along with this presentation with some of the uh, some of our findings uh, in our research. Um, so this is great. This definitely helps us kind of steer our conversation later on. And I appreciate you for, for sharing your thoughts. So taking a step back, um, and kind of setting the stage a little bit more. Um, prior to the pandemic, um, my primary role involved supporting approximately 30 different teams at the University of Michigan Shared Services Center, as John mentioned earlier. Um, I helped them make improvements uh, 
in their work and identify possibilities that they can pursue. So I served as an embedded coach and I would visit and work with those various teams in the finance, HR, and even operational support at the Shared Services Center uh, once a month. But um, so during my observations of the teams during their daily standups, meetings, and general interactions, I focus on four key areas to, to assess. Um, the first area that I examined were how teams measured their work and whether they were utilizing metrics to understand the impacts of their work on themselves and for their customers. Uh, second, I would assess the effectiveness of their communication uh, amongst one another, with their leaders, and again, with their customers. Uh, we'll um, try to understand how they were approaching problem solving, um, whether they were simply identifying problems without taking action, or were they actively pursuing solutions to improve their processes? And finally, I wanted to understand uh, the leadership impact that we're talking about today. So I evaluated how team members interacted with their leaders, those supervisors and mid-level managers, and how leaders influenced team dynamic overall. So based on my observations of these four different elements, I categorized teams uh, using a simple green, yellow, red metric. Uh, to help indicate how they were uh, doing overall. Um, so to understand the green, yellow, red metric a little deeper, um, there are some attributes that we categorize uh, among all three of them. So in general, uh, green teams demonstrated a strong grasp of the behaviors and mindset that we were looking for to promote across the university. In essence, they got it. Uh, they served as our model teams, uh, so we would showcase these teams to others interested in continuous improvement work, um, including colleagues at other institutions like you all. Uh, the yellow teams, on the other hand, were generally inconsistent. While they may have moments of excellence, they also experienced periods of stagnation. So their behaviors and mindsets fluctuated. One visit, they were bursting with momentum and ideas. Uh, the next, it was like pulling teeth, trying to understand what they were trying to improve. Uh, and then finally, the red teams are those uh, who do not embrace, understand, or actively pursue improvement on a regular basis. So unlike the green or yellow teams, there is little to no desire uh, within the team as a whole uh, to adopt the necessary mindset and behaviors that we believe would be beneficial. Even if individuals within the team showed overall or occasional flashes of understanding and motivation, um, they unfortunately were overshadowed by the prevailing negative culture of resistance to improvement. Um, so you may uh, resonate with some of these teams or have experience you know, working with um, groups like these uh, where you're at. So um, this metric is what we actually use to monitor our progress over time. Um, and it illustrates the, the state of affairs of those 30-some teams at the Shared Services Center over an 18-month period. Uh, initially, there was some progress in increasing the number of green teams overall through coaching. Um, but however, this progress was countered um, by some teams regressing into red. Uh, also important to note that most of the teams actually stayed in the same place. Some teams consistently remain green, others remain stagnant in yellow or red. So we, uh, myself, particularly put a lot of effort into coaching and supporting these teams and the lack of transformation and mobility from red to yellow to green prompted us to ask that ever important question, why? Uh, so with that, um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Krista uh, to elaborate a little bit more on our situation. All right. So to take this over, I think, Colin, you need to stop screen sharing. There we go. Thank you. And I'll pick up from there. So as Colin was saying, you know, we, we struggled for some time. You can see this is a year and a half of effort of coaching these teams um, we tried many different approaches. We, we kept varying, maybe this will work, uh, maybe that will work. Um, and as you can see, we weren't really making significant progress. 
Um, and, and we got to the place where um, really what, what are we going to do? What's next? Um, we can't just keep putting this much effort in um, and not getting a significant return on that effort. So um, the, the next question, I mean, we really had to make a decision. What are we going to do? Um, was, was it worth trying something else? Um, and finally, we kind of settled on this, this question was, does it matter? Does it really matter if a team is in green? I mean, we certainly came into this believing that it mattered, but we'd never really looked at the data to understand this, this goal we were pursuing, was it worth getting there? And we couldn't answer that question. And so we said, we really need to start with that. We need to start there because why put in all this effort if it just doesn't matter in the long run, if the team is green or yellow, maybe they're all fine. And really by fine, I mean, what we're looking for is we're looking for these teams to be doing continuous improvement, to be creating innovations, to be making progress um, because the, the entity that we work for, the Shared Services Center, has a responsibility to the rest of the university to make improvements and, and help how our business is getting done. So we decided if we're gonna do this investigation, we really need to start with what is, what's our hypothesis here? So the first one, we believe green teams produce more innovation than yellow or red. That's our starting point. Green teams are in fact doing better. Our second hypothesis is something we'd heard so many times in different places. Top level leadership is a key contributor. It's essential for the success of these teams. So this was our starting point. We set out to understand this. Um, we decided to pull together all the data we could find to understand what is it telling us about the improvements that these green, yellow, and red teams were or were not making. And you'll see that each step in our analysis took us another layer deeper as we were learning things along the way. So let's jump into the first thing that we found. So first, the most basic thing we needed to understand was how many teams are green? How many teams are red? So this was our starting point. We found out that only 40% of our teams were actually green. Even this was a bit of a surprise to us because we never really looked at the data this way. We'd been used to using the metric, but putting it on, on a slide this way and really thinking about it, we're like, wow, wow, the majority of our teams are actually yellow. That's interesting. So the next thing we wanted to understand is what did the improvements look like? We've been capturing all the data in a system we call our innovation index. Really, it just leads to, it's a way to input what they had accomplished and it gives us a Tableau report. So we could see very clearly what the teams were doing. And here's what it looked like. All of these little X's, these little improvements, each X is represents an improvement that was done. So we were finding that the green teams, you can see how many more X's they had. This smaller group, is actually producing twice as many improvements. You can see 1.1 per person compared to 0.5 per person. The green team is producing twice as many improvements each year, which was a shock to us. It was like, oh my gosh, they're so much more prolific with this. So then we thought to ourselves, okay, wait, they may be more active. They may be producing more improvements, but what do the results look like? Are they just busy? Are they small things that they're doing on a regular basis? Or like, what kind of impact are they really making? What are the benefits we're getting out of this work? So the next thing we did was we looked at the hours they were actually saving. And we binned it in three different categories. And yes, you'll see the screen that is very, very green. The green bars represent the amount of total savings that those green teams were creating. So just in a glance, you can see that their efforts 
the actual results they're getting are dwarfing what the yellow teams are doing. So in this first category, this is called customer hours saved. What the green teams were doing here was that they were reaching out to the customer and they were finding ways to make it easier for our customers to interact. They were actually saving time for the customer during all of our interactions. Oops, sorry. The second one is taking on the customer's work. Sometimes if they couldn't find a way to save the time for the customer, they would offer to just take on the work for the customer for free. They would just say, hey, would you like us to do that for you? That seems kind of like a hassle for you. We could take that off your plate. And this represents all the savings, all the times they did that. The third category is called team hours saved. And this is when the team is looking inward to their own processes and making improvements there so they're more effective internally. And you can see this is where the yellow team shows up. They've got 36%. And what we notice about that is in some ways we think about that's the, the bar that's like, it's all about me. What's in it for me? How can I improve my own work? So that was a dramatic finding to us that the green teams that are doing so well are, all, are strongly focused on our customer. The yellow teams are making improvements, but mostly for themselves. There's hardly any customer focus at all. So we feel like we answered our first question, which is, does it matter if a team is green? And we realized it matters a lot. It matters a lot. So the next thing we tried to understand is like, what, what do we know about these green teams? What's, what, how do we, what makes a team green? We don't understand it. All we know is they are green and we're seeing good things, but we don't know why can't we coach a yellow team to get there? What's different here? So we thought, does, is it about the size of the team? Maybe there's like a, a right size that's gonna help the team be more effective. But when we tried to look, we looked at the sizes of the green and yellow teams, we could find no correlation, no relationship at all between whether they were green and how big the team was. So that wasn't it. Like, okay, what else? What else? What about the leader, the top level leader, right? That's supposed to be making a huge difference. But what we realized here is that our executive leader was giving the same support to every team. One thing she did was she had a leadership walk with every single team where she would meet with the team on a regular cadence. She would give them support, talk about what they needed, encourage them. She's doing this for every team. That's the same, no difference. We also know they're getting the same coaching. Colin's efforts, he met with every team, gave them all the same encouragement, support, coaching. That's the same. So it's not that. We continue to look, what else is going on? So we said, all right, what about the supervisors, those frontline leaders? We know about those people. So this is where our analysis started to get very interesting. We found that if the frontline supervisor was green, in other words, they're doing all of these great behaviors, positive behaviors that we would hope to see in any good leader, but particularly when we're talking about lean improvements, if the frontline supervisor was green, 70% of those teams were green. Very strong relationship. And then we found that if the frontline supervisor was yellow or red, none of the teams were green, none of them. This was such a, a sharp difference. We're like, okay, here's, here's where something's really happening now. Um, and really our, our takeaway from this was pretty depressing. Like no matter how good your team is, they can't overcome a bad supervisor. They really just cannot overcome it. And to us, that was just a profound finding. We also noticed in our data, we could see that if 
if this green frontline supervisor, um, if this person left and a new supervisor came in who was exhibiting yellow or red behaviors, the team followed. The team would also turn yellow or red. And the converse was true. If you had a yellow or red supervisor and they were replaced by a green supervisor, the team turned green. It wasn't the team. You know, I hear so many leaders complain about, well, my team's just not motivated. My team won't engage. It's not the team. When we change the supervisor, the team suddenly starts performing. So what else do we know? What about these mid-level managers? The next level up, what's happening there? What's their effect? So we looked at this a different way. We said, okay, we know that the teams that are making the most improvements, the very active teams are putting in all kinds of ideas. 88% of those of our top teams have green supervisors. So we knew that, we knew the green supervisors were helping these teams be very effective. But what's the mid-level manager doing? What's their effect on the team? Like, I wish I could see, I wish I could see everyone to ask this question and, and hear your answers, but are, are the mid-level managers green? Are they yellow? Are they red? What we found, which I can't tell you how much this surprised us, didn't matter. It didn't matter. It had absolutely no effect. We saw red, yellow, and green mid-level managers. Nothing could stop this green supervisor. They were just chug, 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 like the little train that could, and they were just like, we're doing this, we're doing this. So we thought, okay, wait, let's look at this another way. We've talked about activity. They're doing a lot of improvements. But what if we look at results? We looked at the teams that generated the most savings. And we found that the majority of those teams had green managers. So here, so a bad manager isn't gonna stop a good team. But if you have a green frontline supervisor and you put a mid-level manager with them, you're gonna see enormous results. These teams were making, they were producing savings that were four to five times larger than other teams. Like it was just a, on a different scale. It's kind of like you have a good supervisor and suddenly you have somebody behind them encouraging them, breaking down obstacles, helping them do things they didn't think they could do. It was an incredible partnership. So that's where we found, okay, you can't stop a green supervisor but you sure can encourage them and help them do even more. So in the end, what we found is that it's really all coming back to that frontline supervisor. The mid-level manager has a potential. I'm not gonna stop the supervisor completely. They have the potential to help, but they're not absolutely necessary. And we found that the top level executive, not so much of an impact. So with that, I'm going to hand this back to Colin to tell you a little bit more about what were those frontline supervisors doing? What was so impactful in their activities? Okay. So thanks, Krista. Um, so now that we know uh, as Krista mentioned, that it all comes back to that frontline leader or supervisor. Uh, we wanted to kind of reflect on what those positive behaviors of those green supervisors were. So what were those common attributes that influenced all of their teams to excel with continuous improvement? So the first I want to point out was, was delegation. So those effective supervisors delegated tasks and empowered their team to take charge of the improvement effort. So they also acknowledged and appreciated their individual differences of team members and their own leadership style. Every leader had their own style and approach, 
Um, but they all avoided micromanagement and monopolizing initiatives. Like they let their staff take control. Uh, they were supportive. They offered guidance when needed without being, again, controlling. Uh, they created an environment where individuals were welcome to contribute their ideas and take initiative. Uh, they actively removed obstacles, as, as Krista mentioned, and provided resources for their staff to succeed uh, their sought after improvements. But above all, uh, these supervisors would be able to boost the confidence of their team, motivate them towards excellence, and celebrate those successes when they had them. Uh, conversely, we want to look at the, those negative behaviors, like what we're holding teams back. Um, so there's numerous negative behaviors uh, that I observed uh, that we want to warn you against uh, when trying to cultivate that culture of continuous improvement. So one common negative behavior was that the leaders showed just general disinterest in making improvements. Uh, they were completely fine with the status quo. So I believe this is a huge hindrance, but again, it needs to be stated. Um, another negative aspect were supervisors who are often inaccessible to their teams. They're preoccupied with larger initiatives or distractions. Uh, and again, they fail to delegate ownership to their teams. Consequently, these teams lack clear targets and goals to motivate them to be better on their own. Uh, and when issues inevitably did arise, um, supervisors tended to, again, revert back to micromanagement instead of trusting their teams to work through an issue, which then further eroded that team dynamic. So in essence, these supervisors uh, weren't leading from the front and bringing people along with them. Now, what about those mid-level managers? Uh, the people that the supervisors would report to, as Christian mentioned earlier, that if you had great mid-level managers in addition to green supervisors, it was like a firestorm of innovation. So despite being uh, a level removed from the frontline supervisors and two levels from the teams, these managers remained present, uh, engaged and supportive, uh, engaged and supported them uh, in the improvement efforts uh, that they were striving for. Uh, they showed interest in the work without, again, imposing directives or dictating. Uh, they were able to maintain a balance between involvement and delegation. Uh, they exhibited a proactive attitude toward improvement, driving teams forward and motivating them again toward progress. And finally, as a good leader does, uh, they help their teams align their actions with the overall organizational goals um, and were not hesitant to challenge the status quo again, aiming for meaningful change wherever it could be made. Uh, now, there may be other behaviors that are important. But again, these are the ones that we know are vital to continuous improvement efforts of an organization. Um, so again, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Krista to revisit and reflect um, our hypothesis again and kind of close us out. So kind of coming back to this, um, you know, we, we started out thinking green teams produce more innovation. They really do. We confirm that. That, that is, in fact, true. Um, we felt very confident saying that, that we knew this was a goal worth pursuing. Um, but as for the next one, top-level leadership is a key contributor to innovation. What we found is that um, we're going to give the answer as a resounding well, maybe. Um, I think people often look to this leader. This is the leader that's often providing funding for a continuous improvement effort. And so this leader's topmost in our mind. But what we found is that this leader is really, they're just too far away from the front action to have a huge impact. Yes, it's important. We're not denying, of course, they're the ones that are saying, yeah, we, this, we'll give you some funding to try this, this whole lean thing. But the, the analogy that I, I've been thinking about is they're a lot like sunlight shining on a garden. It's important, but you can grow a garden full of flowers, or with that same sunlight, you can grow a garden full of weeds. The difference maker is that frontline supervisor. They're the gardener. 
They're tilling the soil. And by that, I mean, they're helping to create a positive culture. They're pulling the weeds. They're watering regularly. Their impact is enormous on the success of any kind of continuous improvement program. And the reason, one of the reasons I really wanted to talk about this presentation, the idea is that I think we focus too much on that high level leader and worrying about that. But you know what, if we're not working with that amazing frontline supervisor and making those continuous improvement results, pretty soon that high level leader isn't really gonna be interested in giving you funding anymore. You really wanna focus on finding partners good gardeners for your partners. Look for those positive behaviors. Um, so that that's kind of, to us, that was a really important finding. We're, never, we're not trying to dispute that the top level leadership isn't important, but if you're looking to create some results, you really gotta look for that frontline leadership. So just kind of like stepping back to look at the key takeaways from our, our whole investigation. When you're thinking about those frontline gardeners, as I think of them, all of them have their own style and that's good. There's no one style that works, but look for those positive behaviors, the ones that are really enabling their staff and creating that culture where improvements and improvement ideas can really flourish. Again, remember teams of good leader, leaders delivered twice the improvements as other teams and the impact, the actual benefits were four to five times higher. So we just wanna say, if you're looking, if you're a practitioner and you're looking to find a group to work with, choose your partner carefully. Um, we've had many partners over time in our program who were not good gardeners. And I can just tell you, you're gonna have a very difficult time making progress, showing demonstrated, having people adopt these methods, showing results, it is really tough going. And finally, we feel like you don't always have to wait on executive leadership. You can make a difference just looking for that motivated frontline leader. We think that is really the key to making positive change. And with that, I think we're ready for questions. Thank you again for uh, letting us share our story with the group. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Krista. Could I ask you to stop sharing your, your screen, please? Thank you. Um, and that way um, we can see, well, unfortunately you can still see me, but um, we can see Krista, Krista and Colin um, in terms of answering the question. So not that you could see it, but I, I was nodding furiously throughout the entire presentation. I thought we got some great insights there. Um, and that's reflected in, in um, the, the Q and A. Um, there's some comments that aren't questions, but just um, you know, very, very positive about um, the work that you've done, the findings, and just how fascinating an insight it is. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try and get through as many questions as, as I can, um, but just one, um, hopefully, fairly simple one. Um, I think um, one of the um, attendees has kind of may have missed this at the start, but what what when did when did you start doing this um, investigation and what time period does it cover? So I can take that one. Uh, so I first started mid two thousand eighteen, uh, and I believe this uh, assessment goes through two thousand the end of two thousand nineteen. So right before the pandemic started. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so John, if you're wondering why why it's 2024, like why have we been waiting on this story for so long? And I, I think that comes back to me. Um, I think I couldn't go to one more conference where people were talking about the high level leader and how they couldn't move forward without the high level leader. And I was just like, that's it, that's it, Colin. We're gonna we're gonna show our story and help people. Like I feel like just get going. Just get going. And so that's why um, I just yeah. was um, motivated to talk about what we did to help people know that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's, it's a good point to, to make because similarly, I've, I've, I've heard that a lot as well. And it's not dismissing that it is important, but I think the way you described it in terms of sunlight and um, yeah. flowers and weeds, I think is a, is a great way to 
um, to to think about that. Um, you know, if it's not there, it could be an issue, but it's um, you know, it's not the be all and end all, as as it were. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of it, so the I guess the team's performance, so green, yellow, red, um, did. I guess there's a couple of things here and there's uh, one of the questions I'm going to kind of expand on it a little bit. So did you use clear definitions from what differentiated between green, yellow and red? And so and I'm assuming the answer is yes, but I'm sure you're going to tell us what they are. And the, the, the bit I'm going to add on, did the teams themselves know that? Mm -hmm. So I can try to take both of those. Um, so when I first started, obviously trying to stay as objective as possible and treating each team the, the same way was definitely important. Uh, I believe I started out with you know, kind of a scale like one to five on, on certain criteria that we were looking at. Um, so those four elements that I had shared, there were some deeper things that went into each of those. I won't go into, um, but those are just kind of four of the high level, um, I guess, snapshot of what I was looking at. So it was important for us to um, to stay objective in there. But again, over time, um, it was noticeable that teams um, and supervisors, they, just, they weren't moving. Uh, they weren't migrating from, from uh, red to yellow to green. Um, and John, what was the, the second part of that question? Did, did the teams know the criteria you were judging them on? Um, somewhat, yes, they did. So part of this... Um, the evaluation was our daily management system, which can which comprise uh, different components uh, that I mentioned. Um, so they knew um, what that daily management system consisted of, but overall they did not know how I was scoring them necessarily, like individually. We wanted to keep that anonymous. Okay, I, you Thank know you. I'll add that it, I, I think the teams always knew because when Colin was coaching them, he would say, "Okay, these areas are fantastic." These other two areas, we want to see you work on this. Here's maybe a goal to work towards. So they knew really clearly which areas they needed to um, work on strengthening. Okay, thank you. Um, now, I think that this is a, all good questions, but I, I, I like this one in terms of the, the teams that you're working with. Um, were they all kind of working in similar areas or, or types of activity, for example, frontline student services, or where are their, their types of work different, which did that have any impact at all? So the type of work that it did, did, did that make any difference? I'm not sure if we looked that closely in the data. Um, my gut would say maybe. Um, I One thing I do notice, so at the service center, so we have finance teams, human resource teams, and then those operational support teams. Um, within those, I feel like there were certain elements that a uh, majority of those teams would perform a little bit better in. So the human resource teams would be better maybe like at, at customer service um, and communication piece um, versus finance teams, which would be good at more the, the data collection um, and more... Um, you know, impact um, as far as, you know, innovation goes and understanding that. So, um, but as far as hard data around that, um, no, we did not look uh, at that. Thank you. And um, a question is, is this linked to the viral change approach? And um, this particular person who asked the question found that the bottom-up approach worked very well at um, Southampton University in, in the UK. So um, is it linked to the viral change approach? Um, my advice to you is, if you don't know what that means, I would just say yes. <laughs> yes, it absolutely is. Uh, no, I, I don't know what the viral change approach, but I would say this really was a bottom-up approach, um, uh, working with the teams, helping them move forward. Um, so it, it may be related, definitely bottom-up. Okay, and um, a, a slightly a different question, but an interesting one. So, um, with with you working at University of Michigan, do you get any access to Jeffrey Liker and his research into lean leadership? So, um, well, he is retired now. Have have to put that out there. Um, I think we could have. Um, I never have. I will say um, he was my professor 
a million years ago. Um, he is the person that inspired me to spend my career doing this. Um, but I feel like most of his work um, is focused on the automotive sector and based on the feelings from Toyota. And I don't know that I've seen him write a lot about higher ed and applying mm -hmm. this in a different kind of setting. But that just could be, it might, I might have missed it. There might be something out there now. Okay, which which takes me into another question because I'm going to jump ahead one actually because um an, another it's not really a question but well it is I guess um this um person would love to see your findings in a paper have you have you or would you consider publishing your findings because um I think the, the feeling is it'd be very helpful. Thank you. Um, actually, um, Bill Balzer did um. He also encouraged me and he's offered some resources to help me get started on doing that. Um, so it's considering it. So watch this space. That, I think it's a fascinating subject and, and would absolutely be great to to take it that to that next next step. Um in terms of metrics, coming back to that, so you've you've talked a bit about metrics that you've you've used. What kind of metrics did you apply? to things like team communication and leadership behaviors in, in your evaluation? So as far as the, the assessment goes, is that? Yeah. Uh, so I think it was more, again, so most of this was driven by, by observation. So it was, you know, when I would visit, as far as team communication goes, um, but I visit daily standups and no one was talking about the work or no one was talking about an improvement effort. Like that was a red flag. Mm -hmm. Um, so as far as like, again, measuring that, it was kind of like a, a scale, you know, one to five going into it. So that could be applied, um, on all those four elements, um, just by general observation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I guess one, one of the other things I'll add on to that, John, was all of these teams do daily stand-ups and they have visual huddle boards. And so even without talking with the team, like we could observe what was happening on the huddle board. So we had different methods of insight into what was happening. Um, so, you know, if, if you're looking at a huddle board and the team has no metrics about how they're doing and no metric about anything they're working on, you know, they're, they're telling you a story. Um, uh, there were lots of different indicators mm -hmm. of how these teams were doing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm, as I say, trying to get through as many as possible because there are quite a few interesting ones. I'm jumping ahead and, and um, I would love to hear the answers to these ones. But um, so next one is, what did you do, if anything, about the red teams? Or what are you planning to do if you haven't done anything yet? Well, I think um, what we found is that we, we, we couldn't help them to actually make a behavior change. Like, I don't know how many people try to lose weight. If, if you have, you are, you're aware yourself of how difficult it is to change behaviors. We found it enormously difficult to try to make an impact on some of these supervisors and change some of their behaviors. So over time, we moved away from focusing on trying to improve that and focused more on setting a minimum activity goal that we expected. We asked each um, team to produce at least one innovation each quarter. So we just kind of set a minimum threshold of activity so they weren't doing nothing. They were trying to do something and we focus more on supporting the green teams, putting our energies there to help the teams that were excited about it, who could not get enough coaching as well as they were doing. They were so excited and when Colin would come back and kind of give them extra attention, they just thrived. And so we tried to focus, if we think back to the garden analogy again, we focused on the plants that were really well suited to this climate we were trying and gave less attention to plants that were just not going to thrive in this environment. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and there's there's a, there's a few related questions about about that um, last point. So let me see if I can um, paraphrase into something that covers a, a few of the questions. Um, so we've talked about the red teams. Um, there'll be teams yellow. So how do you? What is the approach to try and coach? I guess. Um, uh, team from yellow to green green and can we can we coach the frontline supervisor for example to move from yellow to green um or to to directly uh, ask the question from this um attendee is is replacement of the leader the on, only way to do that really great question um thinking back to my approach approach with those yellow supervisors, I would say there's probably two things that would mainly contribute them being yellow. So one is just a, a situation, like I mentioned before, like one, one time they may have had capacity to really showcase what they were working on. Um, and the next time they could have been swapped in, in work and not having, um, you know, the, the time to dedicate to, to improvement. So that was one aspect of helping just them prioritize and understanding like, um, the, the flow of their work that was coming in to, to take advantage of the time when you have it uh, to make those improvement efforts. So that was one main coaching effort. And as far as the, the supervisors themselves, I feel that um, I think it is, I mean, it's definitely more possible to, to coach them into being green. Um, I think that kind of like what Krista mentioned, that maybe the environments or the the type of work or transactions or the things that they were doing weren't suited to them. Um, but I think it it is possible. It's just finding that focus, finding that that bright spot um, that they can rally around um, as a supervisor and as a team. So if, if I could add to that about those bright spots, um, we've, we've done a couple things since we did this analysis. The first is offering problem-solving labs um, and what those were, were those were opportunities for some of those bright spots? Like suppose you're a person really excited about lean, but you, you have a red supervisor. This is a chance for that person to come to a problem solving lab and learn how to do this and get direct coaching from Colin, um, in a seven week course and really like kind of learn to do this without that supervisor. Like Colin's a, it's kind of the surrogate encouraging them to engage. And we saw some amazing results with those problem solving labs. They really love that. The other thing that we've done is several times when we've identified issues across all teams that we could see, everybody's struggling with this a little bit, the yellow teams much more. We would go, we would have a leadership meeting where we bring all the supervisors together and do like a short coaching session, you know, maybe like uh, 40 minutes focusing on a specific topic, like um, here's how to facilitate your team to talk about this sort of work, or here's how to ask open-ended questions so you don't just like shut down conversation in your team. Like once the team starts talking, you're gonna have a better chance, you know, helping them learn how to engage. Mm -hmm. um, or if they're, if they're struggling with an element of problem solving, we might focus on just that, that element to help them get over a, a difficulty there. So kind of some group coaching with all the supervisors. So no one supervisor feels like, oh, it's this is about me not doing it. Um, kind of like, helping everyone work together. And also helping the, we're hoping there's like some of the green supervisors are modeling the, their behavior a little bit where the other supervisors, the ones that are struggling can kind of observe what they're doing and hear what they're doing um, to try to move forward. Okay, thank you. And um, just a follow on from that, um, and this this one's from from me, I guess. And it's just you mentioned um, so senior level um, um, buy in, if you like, support less important. Back to the sunlight um, thing. Have you shared these findings with your executive lead? And is there any role do you think that they can play in helping to bring teams up from 
Yeah, so not not necessarily the level of support, but actually, if, if I was in that position, I'd be I'd find this fascinating, and I'd actually want to try and do something to to change it. So, have, has there been any conversation around that? So, um, Kyle and I are looking at each other. Who's going <laughs> to take this one? So, one thing that is still continues is that Colin meets monthly with the mid level managers one on one to essentially coach them and help them understand what their teams need and how to, how to help. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I think I have to say, I don't know that the mid-level managers are any different than the frontline managers. If they're red or yellow, we mm -hmm. had an enormous challenge getting them to change their behaviors. Yeah. You know, if they're comfortable being a micromanager, it's really hard. They have to want to, make that difference themselves there wasn't much we could impact them with on the outside i don't know colin yeah. you would have anything to add on that yeah i i echo the the same sentiment and like krista mentioned before for those green teams that i would visit and they would want me to keep on visiting and, and want more and more i observe that again from those mid-level managers as as i kind of meet with them and coach them um you know those those green managers are the ones that want to to know more um versus the maybe the, the yellows the yellow or red managers that just like this isn't their cup of tea like this is not something that they they want um they'll try to make the best effort um they can um but it's just not the the mindset that they're they're strong in yeah okay this gets back to our point of if you're going to start an initiative or you want to try to work with a department to really get a continuous improvement program going, pick your partner wisely. Talk, ask around, like, who's someone that others really admire, who you see these positive behaviors from. Those are the folks you want to work with. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank for... Just the opposite is true. I often find top executives want you to work with a team that's really struggling. And often they have one of these yellow or red managers. And I'm like, this is going to be rough sledding. Okay, time for one last question. And it's, uh, well, it's, it's a bit of a biggie. So um, we've talked about ground up. We've talked about the importance of frontline supervisors. Um, and in your case, this, this isn't the case that there's, there's little awareness of senior leadership. But in a model where there's a lot happening on the ground and the senior leadership perhaps aren't, aware of it, aren't supportive of it. Is is there a danger that the whole program or initiative falls when there's a change of, of senior leadership? And how can we, I guess, guard against that as um, as a community? So, you know, our president or vice chancellor changes, doesn't believe in continuous improvement. What can we do to, um, I guess, mitigate the risk of the program failing when there's that change of leadership? I don't know. I mean, we those are just going to happen. It's sometimes you're going to have a cloudy day. But the thing I would um, emphasize is they're really far away. Um, sometimes you have bad weather, but everyone keeps gardening. Right? Focus on that level because they're fine. They don't even know what the chancellor is doing. You know, it's too far away to make. And, you know, the sun is going to come out. Things keep changing at a university, I find. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let that rock the boat too much. We've seen high level leaders change and it hasn't really affected the, our program. So keep keep doing good work. Keep um, evidencing the the benefits of um, the work that you do, and um, the rest will hopefully take care of itself. Okay. Well, listen. Thank you very much. We have run out of time. Um, Kristen, Colin, you will be able to see um, some of the remaining questions if you do have time to to hang around and perhaps um, type the answers in. If you have time to do so, and I know you're both um, very busy, and it's just the start of your working day. Um, so listen, thank you very much again. Um, we are going to move um, very swiftly into um, a, a very short um, presentation on the 
2024 International Conference, um, which Linda Spinks from the University of Cambridge is going to take us through. So just a very short overview of what to expect um, and look out for in the International Conference when it comes back to Europe and, and in the UK in um, October of this year. So Linda, over to you. Thanks, John. Just um, make sure I turn my sound on and share my screen. Okay, so um, great to uh, share our growing plans for the conference in 2024. Um, just a few short months now. I'm sure those months will fly by really quickly. Um, so, yeah, conference is coming to Cambridge, um, 23rd to the 25th of October this year. Um, we are, our website is live. There'll be a link, the very last slide will include a QR code with um, a link for you to access our website. It's, the website is now at the stage where more information is being added all the time. Um, Registration and submission of abstracts will open on Monday of next week, perhaps towards lunchtime, talking to our um, website people. Um, it will be sort of late morning. Um, so our theme, sustainability and lean, bridging innovation and tradition, thinking about processes for now and the future. Um, this information is on the website, but just to give you an idea, if you're thinking about submitting an abstract, um, We've look, we're looking at this from different angles. And I think some of that actually talks to the um, presentation we've just seen uh, from Krista and Colin about, uh, and that sort of last question, how do we um, make sure there's a, lean, there's a legacy both within our institutions and within the network? How do we create sustainable processes? Um, how do we sustain ourselves and make sure we, we continue to be, um, to be effective and efficient? Um, Etc. Etc. But there's there's lots of hints and tips on the web page for that. Um, what have we got in store? We've got a lot of things in store. Um, we're still, as you're aware, very much in the planning stage, um, but we're already thinking about how we can best share some of the history of Cambridge with with attendees. Um, the first day we will be at the Cambridge Union Society, which is the home of the um, the debating chamber. Um, where debates have been held for, for centuries now, a couple of centuries now. Um, the first time I had um, any awareness of that, was, there was a live stream of, um, of course, the University of the Dalai Lama speaking from the debating chamber. So we'll be walking in the steps of some, some quite um, famous people. Um, we'll be having the conference dinner at Fitzwilliam College, which is one of the 31 Cambridge colleges. Um, I'm looking forward to a, a great evening there. Come on, slide, move on. So I'm just going to play you um, our conference video. And see you mean the technology will work and it will play. Um, and then we'll um, just close off after that. How do we sustainably bridge the gap between tradition and innovation? Here at Cambridge, we're no strangers to tradition, from cobbled streets to historic buildings to gowns and graduation ceremonies. We've been known for academic excellence for more than 800 years. From this tradition springs innovation, the discoveries of gravity, evolution and DNA all have their roots at the university. From stem cell research to botanical firsts, Cambridge respects the past but dares to do things differently. But in a world that is ever evolving, how do we ensure that we keep moving in a sustainable way? From profit, to people, to planet, we need to have a long-term sustainable vision for the future. Continuous improvement and a lean way of thinking provides us with a framework to support our traditional structures, whilst allowing future generations the space to grow and meet their needs. Implementing sustainable change isn't easy, but these challenges are the foundations upon which we build our bridges to the future. Throughout its history, Cambridge University has maintained a position of distinction amongst global universities, not by standing still, but through a process of continuous evolution. 
from historical challenges to recent issues like Brexit and the COVID-19 pandemic, the university has shown its ability to respond to challenges by adapting and changing. Fostering a culture of continuous improvement in our universities is essential for us to maintain our position in the world of higher education. The University of Cambridge's mission, and indeed our passion, is to contribute to society through education, learning, and research at the highest international levels of excellence. We know many of you share this passion. We are delighted to invite you, our higher education colleagues from across the globe, to join us in Cambridge in 2024 to learn from and inspire one another. The Lean HE Network has been encouraging us to share our stories for over 10 years. Coming together from across the world, we found motivation and inspiration in each other's stories and we can't wait to welcome you to the University of Cambridge in 2024 to hear your stories and together discover how we can improve processes both for now and in the future. Why is it? Don't we just love technology? There we go. So, um, so next up, really, from everyone, um, put the dates in your diary, look out for our communication through our, the usual channels. You might have seen a little bit of activity on the various LinkedIn groups. Um, we'll be sending out a, uh, emails, we'll, towards near the time we'll be sending out a newsletter. So if you've registered an interest, um, you'll be receiving something into your inbox. Think about that theme. Think about what you might like to um, submit as an abstract. And yeah, if you've got any que questions, emails there to contact us. Um, the final slide, um, I'll just leave it up for, I'll continue sharing for a, a few seconds. Um, there's a QR code there that will give you access to our conference website, which as I said, will be um, updated with more information as and when we get it. Thank you. That's all I had to say. Thank you so much, uh, Linda, for coming here and uh, making a small promotion for the conference. Uh, for me, it's, it's hard to explain how much I look forward to this. This is kind of my, my favorite conf conference. And now it's happening kind of in, in the area and, and the surroundings of uh, University of Cambridge, uh, which to me has a sp specific sound of quality and history. Uh, so if there are any questions uh, for Linda regarding the conference, you could still put them in the Q&A uh, app. But I have one question that does not relate to any of the uh, presentations or stuff that's going to be in conference. But would it, for me, for instance, be <clears throat> would I be able to have a go at punting? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure you'll be able to. One of the things that we're putting together is a bit of a sort of a scavenger hunt, um, a list of activities that people can do while they're in Cambridge, and I think having a go at something will be on that list. So we'll signpost um, where people can go. Keep praying for good weather, though, because it can, you can get quite wet in the punt. If I do that, I'll make sure to have it um, filmed so that oh, absolutely. I could share with the community when I fall into the river. Um, there doesn't seem to be any questions directly related to the conference, but as Linda said, um, it's possible to send those directly to the conference and the, and the hosts and the, the team behind it. There will, of course, be more information on the conference on uh, our our different channels and and um, uh, John will say a little bit about that towards the closing of this uh, webinar. So again, thank you, Linda, for coming and promoting the conference and and um, putting a little bit of anticipation into our hearts and minds. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Um, thank you, Linda. Um, so just 
really to 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 close the session today um it's just really to thank everyone thank all of our um, presenters for making the time um very much appreciated um and just really a plea and, and a, a, to to all of you to to stay connected with our community um we can learn so much from one another and support one another um, by being part of the community, and there's different ways in which you can you can stay connected. So there's a, a, a Lean HE Europe LinkedIn group, which I have sent the link on the chat. Um, there's also a Lean HE Europe website, and also a Lean HE Global YouTube channel. So the intention is to um, well, this this webinar has been recorded, and it will be uploaded um, to the global YouTube channel in the coming um, days ahead. Um, we've got, I think, around about 160 subscribers to the channel and about 60 videos um, from um, ranging from the 2021 conference hosted by Strathclyde, the 2022 conference hosted by the University of Melbourne and um, content generated by various um, networks across Europe. So I would encourage you, if you haven't already looked at that, please do so. Um, because there's a lot of um, really good content on that and lots lots to, to learn from other people in the community. So last thing for me is really just to say thank you for attending and um, I very much hope to see you at a Lean HE event sometime soon. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs>